Let's see. As you know, this course has been Students who had uh, gone through this course and, and had taken part in their activities in the institute are now quite well established in various industries and in university. Two of them, uh, Shambhuid Mandal of 2002 and uh, Yogesh Tamdash of 2004 will be receiving their degrees from MIT tomorrow and day after, or today and day after. Fourth is when uh, Somanyit will receive his degree and uh, Jogesh will receive his tomorrow. Jogesh incidentally has received the Jack Kilby Award, which will have a question to refer to of ICC this year. So, we do think some of you would continue to work in uh, VLSI design and uh, other activities and uh, will become well known. One of them was not only really VLSI designer but was from electronics. Uh, Uddhala Bhattacharya has done excellent work and that's recorded in ICC digest there. That was uh, a chief from Intel. We, let, we may have a question to refer to that as well. So all I'm saying is some of you at some time point in time will uh, probably contribute to say, technology device and circuit development which would make us proud of, of you. Uh, the, the topic today is <coughs> introduction to VLSI. side. Now it will be more uh, more like a story lab than actual classroom lecture, uh, and you should take it that way. So the outline is mentioned there. So the trouble with when you see this and that is you are unable to speak. When you see, the, oh, they have seen already. Why do why should we have to speak? Uh, so the next slide. Yeah. The, what is, I think, pretty important for us to remember is uh, the development that we see today are due to many inventions and discoveries that have taken place over the last uh, hundred years. You couldn't have electronics unless you had the thumbs up. You couldn't have any different device unless you have high vacuum techniques. And uh, coming to more recent times, which is the era starting from 1950s, and this is some which had direct lessons to what is happening today and what is going to happen in future. Uh, some of the novels, the novels merely indicate the, the climax has been some efforts by some groups, some people. Uh, of 100 people who could have uh, caught the Nobel, one did. That does not in any way take away from the, uh, the genius and the uh, work of the other people. But anyway, we all know, most of you do know, that the Junction transistor, the Chinese point of point contract and latent junction transistor work was carried out mainly by the AT&T group by Shockley Bardman, and that that was the beginning of the era. There are many others which I have, I have listed. You may be familiar with some, you may not be familiar with some, but it would be good to take note of this. Some will be. Uh, will become more important later on. Some are already important. For example, to my mind, the magnetization, giant magnetization uh, 
what would you call it? invention or discovery, but he just found, they called that. It was, it was not predicted, but uh, also not unknown that this would going to happen. I mentioned enema for a number of reasons, because not merely because of the application, many applications, but also there are many ways in which you can use this. Uh, if I have time, I will refer to an application of NMR uh, which could lead to a chip design by some of you. Everybody knows about Tanley. Most of you are familiar with the uh, terms I have used. Are, are you familiar with them? For example, you know about majors and lasers? You are familiar with holography? Familiar with tunneling? Hero structures were possibly familiar with the two materials being put together for it. And uh, Kilby and Noise are pretty well known because of the invention of the circuits. And the first ICs were made, which are very, very simple. Looks like there was a single, single junction transistor with a few passive components, and they showed that you could make an oscillator, you can amplify with it. Uh, that it seems to us, it doesn't seem to be very common. Uh, you can walk in, walk out whenever you wish. Uh, okay, so it doesn't seem to be very a uh, big thing to us today. When a uh, single chip, I will see later on, contains, it's rather late, uh, two, bit, two billion transistors. That has a single transistor. But that was the beginning, and uh, so the the last point which I have mentioned there is whether uh, I'm, well, I had been extremely fond of carbon nanotube for three years, but unfortunately, Koropu has not taken it up seriously. Uh, whether or not next Nobel will be done by someone. Uh, some people who had worked on by, uh, on carbon nanotubes. Unfortunately, there are many contenders, and we don't know what is going to happen. Yeah, you said in the VLSI required transistors, required many levels of technology. We'll, we'll see them one by one and uh, some sad stories as well, of uh, making good crystals, then making a bracial layer, diffusing, going, you know, whatever. And uh, some of these technological inventions, some were, some were discoveries. And uh, the interesting thing about CMOS is that the CMOS was suggested by a postgrad it was not done in, the, in an university, but unfortunately he didn't take any patent, and therefore he didn't earn any money. But you all know the the impo great importance of CMOS into the technology in silicon in in particular. Uh, so some people invent but don't get paid. Uh, one example is in fact for Shockley himself. Uh, Shockley patented the idea of ion implantation. Ion implantation means that you have a source of ions and then they are highly energetic and then the they, they chosen ion, maybe boron or whatever, chosen, chosen ion in a high vacuum impinges on the substrate which we will deposit, goes inside, settles or has a range as well. And uh, he patented that in 1954. Uh, however, the people are working on that. However, it did not become popular before the patent expired. And he couldn't make any money out of it. Uh, so as I said, some people don't make patents, don't get anything. Some people invent, make patterns, again don't uh, get rewarded. 
but but we we are rewarded by those inventional discoveries. I think the the, 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 the roles of invention at all stages uh, should never be underestimated. The world world goes on, grows, develops because of inventions in 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 area. There is one invention which very attracted to me, and that was by Bell in 1795. And that was on what is called photoacoustic sensing. That is, you have light in incident on a material, and uh, you can sort of think that that causes acoustic effect. And that is now being used for finding different uh, the composition materials. So, uh, so long as so long as there are bright people, inventive people things will grow. And one of the one beneficiaries had been on the other side. Ah, yeah. The third point which might disturb you, which will be at the end, is that uh, to some of us it appears that silicon technology has probably reached its the peak. And uh, the scaling down, while it's marvelous, has created many problems which which uh, are not facing physical limits physical limits which would not which you cannot surpass and uh, maybe one has to look for other devices other structures and so on and therefore there is a scope for young people to to think if they could contribute. Now, when you say VLSI, you merely see size. That is, what is the, we say, small number of transistors together is called SSI. Then you had larger scale, a medium scale, then a larger scale, then you have very large. And you stop thinking that you say ULSI. Doesn't make any sense anymore. You stop at V because what do you do? You go to WLSI and then finally uh, end up with ZLSI. So it's enough to say uh, LSI or VLSI. Anyway, there were there were many. many uh, whenever you have a large number of active devices, we say this is large scale integration of active devices. There were passive. There are passive uh, microtonics as well, which are also uh, things like surface, surface acoustic wave, things like thin film microtonics, thin film, thick film microtonics, which are not, we don't use active. Maybe there are some passive uh, active components with them, but these also go by the same name of uh, the microtonics and may not be called VLSI because they may not have active devices. Okay, now there are several things that we have to think of. Uh, we have an end product in, in our mind, a system or a circuit. That is composed of devices, passive components and active components. And uh, we have to then see how do you make them? How do you make the active devices? How do you make the passive components as well. Sometimes they are merely RNC, sometimes also you want to introduce inductors with them. Not very easy, or even transformers, if it is small size. So whatever components you had, this kit form, you say, can we uh, put them together on a single chip? So the first concept was a single chip, single chip of PAM. Now, the op -amp story is interesting. The first discrete op amps were made sometimes in early 60s. The patent probably was two years early. And then the commonest op amp that you use in the lab, or used in the lab uh, till the late 70s, was Saint for one. Saint for one was made sometimes in 69 and became very, very popular. Now, the 
uh, they said, I'm going to more or less tell you story, almost like story. Uh, when the Tanishas appeared, what we did in the 50s, what to, was to make uh, use of transistor to make some circuits. And those on the board, and you soldered them, you wear them, and you get. Then suddenly, you had, oh, here is a single chip which you can make use of for making oscillators, amplifiers, or whatever. The, the digital circuits were also being made. Now, once the op amp appeared, there was a almost a revolution, seems surprising. Almost a revolution. He said, oh, we can make analog circuits and little circuit together. With an op amp, you can make ADC. With an op amp, you can make uh, also flip flops, uh, where they did. In here, welcome to flip flops, you have tons of flip flops. Yeah. And then you can, you can make ADC, you can make PLS and so on. So, all that you made with vacuum tubes, with, with these transistors, in a, in a few years' time, all were converted into IC form in the 60s. But most of them used bipolar, as several one is a bipolar. Now, the other development that took place was that the MOS devices were uh, developed first, straightforward PMOS, easier, then with a lot of struggle, NMOS, and then finally I said uh, the concept of CMOS. That was in mid-60s. And uh, this, this, the, the most important thing about that is that you now have it, have a, a uh, device combination, it's not a single device, it's a combination of n and p -mod. A combination device which enables you to operate at very, very low standby power. And that uh, was optimally important for digital circuits. Once you had that, the, the memory circuits were there. p -mod memory, we remember in our, in our uh, college days, or early, early teaching days, we tried to make things with the with the memories. What we did was, of course, things like uh, bucket brigade lines. Bucket brigade is you you you, you, you have a voltage, you convert charge up a cap, then you have a switch, transfer to the next cap, transfer to the next cap, so it's a serial stuff. You have serial uh, resistors in in digital. It makes serial memory. Now, once you have the, uh, these are all lossy. Um, one example which was useful in other respect is CCD, charge coupled device, which possibly you see later. So, so you had CMOS, and once you have CMOS, gates were easy to make, low loss gates were easy to make, memories are easy to make. And then, started the actual integrated circuit work. To my mind, that's the beginning. And the beginning was the microprocessor. Uh, since you can read them, I don't read out. Yeah. Now then, we had single transistor and those were very big size ones, and the discrete transistor. Status now, let's, uh, I will come back to this slide again. Status now is that you can make win a one centimeter, one centimeter uh, chip as many as a billion transistors. The reason is you can have, you can, you can, the gate lengths can be made small and therefore device things are going to be small. Now, the, some of the term that we are, that uh, we should know is that we are, when you go up to the lab, you'll be working typically uh, if you're 0.25 micron, 0.18 micron, and perhaps 0.13 micron. You can go, you can go to TI, and you can possibly be handling 60 micron or you know, 45 micron devices. So, those were, when we worked in bipolar, 
in the Macrose Laboratory in uh, Electronic Department. That is by itself another story. Uh, the way that they, that uh, laboratory developed. So we started. I said we started in seventy, but we didn't have any uh, way of making uh, transistors. So you you, you started uh, working with surface acoustic wave signal processors, and then there was there at a stage when the country the Ministry of Education realized that the ICs are really important, and that was ICs became important, appear to be important to some good people in the country. Uh, not all, everyone is like what Jun Singh. There are some people who realize that uh, integrated circuits will be important for the country. And in 1976, Mr. Jai and others, they initiated work in the IIT on what is called an IC technology program. That was in 1975-76. And uh, we started working on getting diffusion furnaces, oxidation furnaces, and so on, to make at least some simple bipolar devices, which are able to do only by mid 80s because uh, you, you, if you can mask, mask for uh, making circuits and uh, metallization and many other steps, which have to be fault free. The, the, the difficulty with integrated circuit is you want to make bigger and bigger circuit. There were many steps. When uh, originally a typical bipolar transistor would require just about 18 steps. Uh, in, uh, then now I don't know how many steps require. I was told the other day that implantations required for a typical smash process implantations are fit and there are there are, you will see 18 other uh, processes to be to be carried out so and if you make any error anywhere including metallization or taking leads out that entire effort that you make fails and that 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 you cannot afford the difficulty the a very important thing with cylindrical circuit, the system is big. If the system is big, then you must make sure that all the components are highly reliable. If you have a 99% 99, 99 reliability, it's not good because there are so many steps. If you multiply that by a certain number, everybody knows it will come down to a fraction. What you require, you don't know how many uh, 0.99 you require in order that it actually is reliable. So reliability is one of the most important uh, concerns for, is for integral circuits. It's not ordinarily mentioned, but uh, it is so. You want to make, uh, if you think of any circuit, I mean, see, suppose this changes by 1%, it's too big, 0.5%, again, not parameter. What is the net effect on this circuit? Okay, now this is the, the point I raise about liability is that once you come to this region, the reliability of gate length that you can ensure, of the gate oxide thickness that you can ensure, of the metallization thickness of so all parameters become extremely difficult. The other, other, other difficulty is more basic, which is that the oxide thickness is low, is small, then there is tunneling from the gate to the channel. If that happens, there is a, there is a, there is a loss. And that leakage uh, becomes more and more important as you go lower and run down. So, silicon is going to find to my mind, a limit somewhere at 15 nanometer. Hmm. Yeah, but this is, I'm anticipating what I'm going to, uh, so, may not have time. Uh, the uh, 15 nanometer might be the limit. So what do you do then? Is the question you're going to ask at the, at the end. 
Oh, I just listed historically what uh, we, we consider to be a uh, very large scale. The, the various types of integral side diffusion. So, uh, can go now. Go halfway through almost. Mm -hmm. So, it should be reliable, hopefully. Uh, okay, now you will see that the integral circuit will have passive components. Now, you, you want to place as many components on the chip as possible with this as well. You want to put transistors on the chip, then you have a difficulty that there is a substrate. And the eddy coming in the substrate will cause resistance induced and uh, therefore the Q will go down. There are ways of, of handling those. So sometimes you find it necessary to have not a single chip but several chips together, multiple chips. If you can put as much as possible in one structure, if you cannot break them up and then put them, uh, uh, collect them. Any connection, however, means a loss of speed uh, in the sense that the signal has to get out of the chip and uh, through caps, which are a lot much larger. Inside, inside the chip, the dimensions are small, caps are smaller. Once you try to get out, you have the chip cap, the, the, the output caps, pin caps are very much larger. So you don't want to get out of the chip. Uh, however, uh, there is a limit to what you can what you can do. So there are going to be hybrid structures as well, and there will be instead of single chip, you might sometimes require multiple chips modules. Okay, this I have, I think I mentioned. Ah. The, the, the last thing which is the technology development has an interesting story. Amongst these, lithography which is actually transferring a pattern onto the substrate, lithography, the word lithography is well known. If the, if the litho printing is known, most of you know of litho printing I believe. Uh, that idea, the basic idea was known to people in the in 1792. Uh, but the, the form in which this is now being used for you have, you have a circuit and you have, it, you have the, the components to be placed, you have the devices to be placed and you have uh, therefore the whole pattern. And that pattern has to be transferred into silicon. And the processes had to go on in different steps. Uh, and these are sometimes you have got photolithography, sometimes ultraviolet lithography, sometimes uh, ion beam lithography, sometimes electron beam lithography, sometimes x lithography for etching out the pattern that you want. And the, that pattern, there were sometimes you have as many as. Uh, commonly, common, uh, the, the, the sort of work that we did would require 15 to 20 uh, mass steps. But today I don't know how many mass, mass level they require. The other thing is the, okay now, I don't think I'll get, I will take time on these or uh, some of these you can learn very easily by going to the labs. There is a there is a molecular being a MBE machine in physics, which you can go and see. And uh, what else? You can go to Microsoft's laboratory to see the the diffusion furnaces, the mass making, and the metallization processes. So some last items you can see in the in the labs institute. Yeah, this merely you can, can forget about this. Now, there are we commonly talk of silicon technology. Uh, initial, initial, uh, the op that was Kilby's patent 
was a germanium transistor. The silicon people tried to make, and of course developed in my, my mid-60s. One of the one of the finest things about MOS in the early phases was that MOS was said to be self-isolated because you put a gate, it's only then the channel is induced, and therefore you get uh, a conduction. But we all know there are stradlers. There will be some electrons which go from one region to another. I mean to isolate that. Isolation was necessary. Uh, in case of bipolar, you had to do that by sometimes junctions, sometimes by oxide. In MOS, this was introduced once it became smaller and smaller. Uh, they, you had to go into what is called SOI silicon uh, on oxide, sometimes silicon or sapphire, so that you can isolate the different transistors. So that is a very really important stuff. The, in, the important thing is what is the situation now is silicon on uh, band dioxide, silicon on oxide on two sides was what we are talking about. Now we are talking about other devices on silicon. The silicon, silicon is a good substrate because it has a very high conductivity. Uh, thermal conductivity and therefore he dissipates badly well. Three fives have problems. So, the, let's say the role has been reversed. You had silicon on something else. Now, is silicon being used as a substrate for three five? Okay. The other de development which I mentioned was heterostructures. Now, why? See, in the case of C5, we all compound semiconductors. In the group 4, we have uh, group 4 meaning silicon, germanium, and the compounds of silicon, germanium, or the, and carbon. Uh, carbon has only very popular by itself, except when you come to carbon nanotube. So, group 4 has been our major source. Silicon has been our source because of the abundance of silicon. Carbon could be the main source because of the abundance of carbon. But the three fives happen to have much, much higher uh, mobility and therefore are more useful when you go to high frequencies. But these are uh, brittle and at the same time uh, the thermal collectivity is, is a little low. So it heats up pretty easily. The, it said SIG, SICC will find that they, they have been quite a bit of work in the department of electronics and also physics on um, silicon germanium uh, stuff for the last 20 years or so. So it will be very easy for you to find out about this. Now, another development which has taken place uh, over the last, for us electronics, it MEMS was common in and mechanical engineering uh, has been the use of um, uh, nuclear to mechanical stuff with with uh, silicon, not merely for making sensors, not merely for uh, finding acceleration and so on, but also the uh, with RF circuits. So, so MEMS has a uh, micro machining and MEMS has been another component to be added to the uh, VLSI process. Okay. We don't talk much about packaging, although that's it's one of the most important things. And it, once he found out that the, the cost of the chip is determined by the cost of the package. This seems very, very, very uh, strange, but it is so. You, you put it in a, in a Plastic package, it costs something. You have to put it in a ceramic package, the cost goes up. And, uh, yeah. Okay. We just listed the two types of devices which are familiar to you. If it is not, you can uh, pick up. Now, what I have not mentioned is T5, in T5 group, I'm living with bipo silicon bipolar. 
most of you would know a bit about it. Uh, the a gallium arsenide was common for making uh, lasers. Gall indium phosphide was used for transistors. Gallium arsenide also for semiconductor uh, transistors. In a new, not quite new actually, gallium nitride uh, devices are becoming more and more common. And uh, possibly you pretty soon find things like indium arsenide and gallium nitride devices becoming popular uh, for special applications, uh, not for ordinary devices. So one way of improving performance of MOS was to have uh, isolated silicon or insulator. The other way, the, the other has been using at the moment gates all around or double gated. The reason is that ordinarily if you have got a, a gate on one side, then the, uh, the scattering effects are more severe. And uh, you can reduce that by increasing the number of gates around. And sometimes in the case of what is called a fin fed, you find it's uh, the you have a thin ribbon of silicon, which is from the source to the brain, and you have a gate all around. And those are the devices which are being are being used uh, or projected being used for uh, the high speed and low power applications. Yeah. Okay, I think I will skip this. Oh, I did. What are the things which has become very important as the size has been increasing? Is that you cannot afford to go through the process which would require a pretty long time of a large scene. And at the end find there is a failure. There was a lecture given by someone from Intel in the, which month was it? Uh, they had a six core uh, processor with all all stuff and they had a team of 300 people working for six months for a, a processor. Now the design was carried out partly in Israel, partly in India and partly in US. And the, they didn't tell us where this was actually being made. Now what is, so in such a case, it's not that a small team all living in one place, interacting and designing. So you must have uh, the tools for verification, tools for designing, tools for testing, and uh, uh, which are highly reliable. And that's why the the, the CAT tools have become important, not merely for education, cadence tools and so on, but the much, much higher sophisticated tools and accessories. When you are typically using 1 billion to 3 billion transistors, circuits of that kind, then uh, finding out all possible faults, covering all faults, and uh, covering all possible malfunctions become extremely important. Okay. Just shown, yeah, I can't go faster now. Uh, a a SOI technology, that is silicon on insulator. Every year, if there is a conference which is in February, 
the typical days uh, is always age to 12. It earlier was three days, it now becomes five days. That is called International Social Circuit Conference. If you want to find out what is going to happen in the future, what are the things that are going to go down the market in two years' time, then the place to go to is this. If you want to find out what devices are due, uh, are being more or less uh, tested and will probably go into circuit form, then the conference to go to is IEDM. IEDM is International Device Meeting. If one, again, there is a, the, the other conference we should, we should look at is then Automation Conference. So, this is where when you have you've got a chip made, when you have a device being examined, that is in IEDM, when they are, they are considering the uh, automation tools, that will be in DSC. Okay. Yeah, so to go faster now. So I've just listed, it might get, should be available to you, you can see that, it, probably can ask uh, Oniban to show you, what are the typical uh, areas of work uh, which are reported in, was reported in 2007, 2008, 2009. 2009, uh, I've got a copy, the, a copy of, you can have a look at this as well. I'll, 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 I'll merely pick one or two things. There are two developments which uh, have become more important. One is called green electronics. Green electronics meaning you must make sure that, that the impact of whatever you do, whatever chips you make, whatever process you, you follow, would have least impact on the environment. Now, one of the, one of the to me, one of the waste is the mobile, because the mobile, mobile, mobile towers produce a, a large amount of unnecessary microwave power, which is bad for life. Uh, many people make uh, industries where they are, don't care about the effect of the environment on water or on your air around you. So one of the things is you, you, you are required to test what is the effect of, the, of your process, your product on the environment. So people are becoming more conscious about this. The other way is the uh, more emphasis on medical applications, which is perhaps the, one of the important topics in this year's ISSC for the medical. Uh, some of them is used, you would uh, try to find out uh, about some, someone's blood pressure from a distance, someone's state of the, uh, of the implant inside the body from outside. And uh, these, are, these are applications which are, as I said, the concern about life around us. Oh. It's nanoscale devices are useful because you can put large number together. But the difficulty with small scale, which I mentioned in the beginning, was that there is much, much more variability. Variability everywhere, variability in the doping level, variability in the, you have a, you have a B wafer, you must make sure that the, the, the this is perfect. You must make sure the ventilation is uh, true everywhere. You must, so whatever, because you, you're going through large number of steps, at the end, of all the steps, the variation from one point of the chip to another must be small. And from one process to another must also be small. And that becomes more and more difficult when you have a good normal scale. Analog circuits are the 
uh, are, are most affected by variability. Digital circuits doesn't matter greatly. It does matter when you consider leakage, but uh, analog circuits have to be linear. If they have to be linear, then the variation, if you take a take a two transistors or three transistors, between difference between them must be small. It makes differential amplifier. Differential amplifier necessarily requires that the two transistors or transistors assembly to use are indeed very, very similar. It's not necessary for digital work. So a, a big concern today is this variability and its impact on analog. The result has been some there have been some inventors around they say, oh, forget about it. Can you forget about analog as much as you can? Try to forget. Do it digitally. And what are the two what are the alternatives then? Alternative is say, okay, leaving out the antenna and perhaps the power amplifier and the LNA, there'll be no component which is analog. So you get inside, once you get another chip, it's all digital. Some of these are called all digital transceivers. It's not quite all digital, in the sense that uh, LNA cannot be digital. So, but you try to, you control, for example, take, take, uh, and one effort made, which is interesting, that is, with the in making a power amplifier, the power amplifier uh, is not made of one big transistor. It's made of large number of transistors. Okay. Now these transistors work as uh, digital to analog converters. In the sense that they all are given other voltages. As in normal, in the normal DAC, you have got analog potential and you get an analog current, you sum that and you get the output voltage. In this case, the the all digital transmitter, the uh, power amplifier, would have RF input to, to it. And you're going to sum up the output. So, so the, the, you get a large assembly of transistors. And uh, they, these are all almost active digitally. You get unit, unit uh, array voltages, unit array voltages, two different points, you sum up 100 of them. And it, they behave in the same manner as the DSC jars, and you get finally an output. Final output has to be filtered, has to, must have a, a transformer or whatever going to the antenna. So, the one effort is how many parts in a transceiver can you eliminate and have it in digital form? So that's that's one. But then, how do you go to how do you increase the frequency? Then you require the ADC has to be at a high speed. Normal ADCs are generally low, maybe you go to 500 megahertz, mega samples per sample uh, per second to maybe at the most 2 gigahertz, giga samples per second. Let me require that. Can you, is there, any, is there any way of increasing this, the sampling rate uh, to higher value so that you can uh, eliminate analog components as much as possible? So that is what has been forced by scaling down. I said, we are, we are facing many bottlenecks because of the scaling down and silicon is going to see nemesis at 15 nanos, 15, uh, uh, I could say. So, but then people are going to find ways of solving this. And if you can find a good solution, then you can take a patent possibly or you know, build a solution for people. So that's what I meant by 
I'm, I'm choosing one or two topic per slide. I am unable to go fa faster than that. Oh, I say electronics for life science instead. I'll come to this year's this year's staff. This, this is an interesting thing for all, any of you. Uh, and I think this is going to be important. The, the, the importance is partly because of the way the, uh, the, way the, the world is becoming sicker and sicker. And uh, it will be more important for people to, uh, to monitor their own health, health of the, uh, the environment and uh, so that is electronics for life sciences. I leave it out, leave it out, leave it out, leave it. Yeah, okay. No, sorry. How do I go back? How do I go back? There is yeah, I think I have come to the some of the points which I think you should worry about. They said, one, if silicon will stop at 15 micron, uh, 15 nanometer, then what are the options to us? There are several. One of them being suggested is what is called spintronics. Are you familiar with the term? You are. That's right. Now, it's not easy to, it's, it has been predicted for long, and uh, two students of ECE, uh, Kharagpur, uh, one of them is the uh, doctor is 1975 PGM, and uh, the other was his student. They said, you can make spin based on this stuff. Those have not been made yet, but spin-based diodes have been made, and the, there are some diodes which are which are very interesting in the sense that you have ordinarily you have say ferrite. Ferrite has uh, iron oxide or magnetic oxide together with non-magnetic oxide, which would give them a very very magnetic character, not having ferro magnetic character. When you have two, two uh, materials with properties which are very magnetic or, or, or even ferromagnetic, separated by an insulator, you, you can have tunneling through this, you can control this. Now this is becoming, this is a possible, possible device. Uh, whether or not this will, it's not to say that it's going to replace silicon, it's going to replace FIFIRE. But this is an area in which uh, young people should uh, pay attention to. And uh, because this is, this is not immediate, there is no industrial application at the moment, but there are a lot of, lot of things that you can uh, think about and find some solutions, maybe theoretically, maybe experimentally, if you go to good laboratories. What appears, what appears to me to be the immediate solution is uh, C5 on silicon. There are two advantages. You use silicon as much as possible because this is the current technology, conventional technology. We understand it. We know its limitations. We have been with it for the last 40 years. And uh, we have been making circuits, improving them, modifying them, and whatever. There were situations where silicon is 
incapable of solving, uh, solving for you. And you know that three five discrete transistors were are useful. Now, in the case of three five, however, the difficulty that you that uh, you are facing now is silicon has been scaled down, 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 down. Three fives remain at small bigger sizes because three fives are intrinsically have intrinsically higher speed. You scale down to increase the speed. Silicon, they both have, they have intrinsically higher speed. They can afford to have five times bigger size easily. Silicon, silicon electrons have mobility of about 1,000, and good 3.5s would have anywhere between 8,000 to 12,000. So they'll say we, we, are, we, are, we can be 10 times bigger and yet be okay. However, if they also scale down, and they've started doing so, they also scale down and make sure that they can do so well, uh, then for uh, some applications, you could surely use them. One application uh, you can see is what is called terahertz electronics. Terahertz is ranged from 300 gigahertz to 3000 gigahertz. Now, ordinarily, most, most devices stop at uh, 60 gigahertz, can push single germanium uh, systems to about 500 gigahertz, FTs, and operate at 5, 50 gigahertz. Three fives can pretty easily go to that range. And so, this combination of three five on silicon is a large energy. There are, yeah, so. Magnetic stuff is one. Ah, so that's the, you know, I'm almost coming to the end of what I was trying to say. Non-classical CMOS uh, is pin fed, gate, as I said, gate all around, and vertical. Then a T5, T5 on silicon, spin based Carbon nanotube is, yeah, that's what, and silicon nanowire transistors and carbon nanotube are the two items uh, on which probably in future. I'm not saying you're going to be able to work on this in the lab, out, lab there, but this is uh, the direction in which the actually part of this activity in the world to be directed. That would be carbon nanotube were known for perhaps uh, 30 years now. The, the original work, I was surprised to find, we all thought that the Japanese have, have uh, first made it. But it appears now, there were two Russians uh, have worked on this in the 70s. Unfortunately, their, their paper appeared in the Russian journal. Nobody, nobody noticed that. But those have been now found out and probably if Carbon oriented gas and Nobel, there's going to be a uh, struggle between different groups in Europe, uh, Japan, and so on. So please do read about carbon nanotubes. The other thing is the so called silicon non wear transistors. Uh, that is, the main point is to make smaller and smaller devices. Okay. But where do you make them? Or quantum dot structures? Or quantum wear. Quantum dots are quantum dots uh, you can use only for switches, uh, at least at the moment. But uh, quantum wear devices would become more and more popular. So you can learn about some non wire activity in the institute which is being carried out in the Department of Physics. Uh, it is in the lab of the so called microscience lab. Uh, they are working on quantum dots as well as quantum waves. Now there. So three fiber on silicon, and uh, spin base would be take some time to some time. Carbon nanotubes are established. And one reference which I uh, have here is really old uh, in IT built transistors and nanotech uh, in March two thousand five. 
It's called benchmarking non technology for high performance and low power logic on this application. So look this up and see. There are a lot of claims being made now. Everybody now wants to sell himself. There are a lot of being claims, but some of them can be substantive. It's possible that um, carbon alternatives would uh, replace a part of the IC market fairly soon. Oh, yeah, they have been uh, said once you are. You are, the silicon has been serving us for so long and so well. It's very difficult to think of other alternatives. Now, you want when you want to, if you want to make big device, you must also large memory. And what if, when you try to make uh, silicon, uh, the memory is in silicon, big size uh, RAMs, there are problems. So, people are looking at. Not mainly device structures, but also new. Oh, if you look at this, it's like a cinema hall. Uh, new new memory structures, and this I can actually read out. Uh, there were some three five some uh, some switches, which are which are based on what is called phase change. Where the material kind of on the phase change, phase change meaning. Material in one phase has high resistivity. In the other phase, uh, just by heating or by passing current, it goes to a low resistance state. So that's a switch, and that that is that is uh, is well known. And these are called the so-called circle net. But once <sighs> terrible mistake, the <laughs> now no has become now. <laughs> yeah, probably there will be a device called now. now. Uh, so there were fuses and antifuses. Fuses are when you, you break and, and then the end has come out. And the other is antifuse, antifuse make connections. Ferroelectric RAM is that the dielectric is no longer silicon, silicon dioxide, but clear. Uh, they, they, you, you, you replace that by a ferroelectric material. A ferroelectric material, not always ferro, but it could be uh, high dietary constant and retains charge. It retains charge for a long time and uh, they, that, the, 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 the ferroelectric rams have been, have, been, have been suggested by the Japanese for long. Nobody cared very much. But this is becoming popular. Okay. The moderation system I had occasionally made, referred to. The interconnects are so many changes are going to place, are, are, are going to take place. These are in all directions. In devices that you're using, the memory structure you're going to use, interconnects that you can use. So what you what you have so far was a stable world based entirely on silicon and this world is going to be stabbed. Not mail by mail down, but by the fact that we are coming to the limit of the market forces, the limit of so this is the warning sign that we may not be able to go beyond. 15 nanometers, and we have to look for solution. And I think young people can find new solutions. And I think, any questions? Hey. Actually, at least one question of some kind. Oh, 
Oh, I said you got to, you got to refer to uh, the work by Uddalak. Uddalak's work is in RAM section, which is what it's area. So Intel group making the sizes are becoming so big they're too large. Okay. 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 Okay.